Watch art in action as amazing chalk artist Ray Dombeck applies his artistic talents to bring the canvas to life in this video presentation. Let's turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. And this is the passage that speaks about the great white throne judgment, which takes place at the end of time. This is one place you would not want to be with a guilty verdict. In verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Have you ever watched a TV crime show called To Catch a Predator by Chris Hansen? This is a police show where sexual predators are caught on camera trying to entice young teenage girls. But many times these teenage girls are police officers in disguise and the embarrassment and shame is unimaginable as these predators are handcuffed and taken away. And I think of the O.J. Simpson trial and how his life was exposed on television for the whole world to see. And then there's the trial of Saddam Hussein as he was given the death penalty for his crimes against humanity. There is the recent conviction of Harvey Weinstein and his sex crimes against women. The love of sin always leads to ruin. And one judgment I would never want to be in is the Great White Throne Judgment. What is the Great White Throne Judgment? This is where the unsaved of all the ages from Cain to the end of the millennial reign of Christ will be judged for their sin and then forever cast into the lake of fire. It is in the lake of fire that they will be eternally removed from the presence of God. And this is that final judgment against sin. In Romans 6.23 it says that the wages of sin is death and sooner or later the wages of sin will come. Now who will appear at the white throne judgment? Jesus Christ will be there as judge, and then the unsaved will be there, those who have rejected Christ and his offer of salvation, and then there'll be those who have made a false profession of faith. This is where their hearts were never truly right when they made a profession of faith. They had a corrupt motive. And like Simon the Magician in the Bible, when he made a profession of faith, he wasn't interested in his sin. All he wanted was power of the Holy Spirit. The false profession of faith comes from a corrupt motive. They're interested in what they can gain, like fame or power or money or maybe to get out of trouble. The false profession of faith is not interested in their sin and the person of Jesus Christ. And so you'll have those who have made false professions of faith at this great white throne judgment. And then there'll also be those who love their sin more than God. These will be at the white throne judgment. And such people, they love their sin. They try to keep their sins secret. They have what you call sins that are pet sins. In other words, they're not willing to forsake their sin. And they got the idea that their sin may just be a small sin or just one sin. Because of this, they live a life of sin. But you know, Jesus died for all of our sins, whether it's one or many. And that one small pet sin put Jesus on a cross, put him through the crucifixion. And by the way, it only takes one sin to keep a person out of heaven. And I can't think of any sin worth going to hell for, whether it's a pet sin, whether it's for the sin of money, position, adultery, or shacking up. The wages of sin always ends in ruin. Now, I go fishing a lot, and a lot of times I like to take gospel tracks with me and witness the guys fishing along the bank. And I like to ask them if they died, do they know if they're going to heaven? And most of the time they won't know. And I ask them, why don't you know about your salvation? How old are you? Are you 35, 40, 50 years old? And you've never inquired about salvation? And the truth is, the reason they don't know if they're going to heaven, they never was interested enough to find out. They were too busy living for self than to care about their eternal destiny. They were too sorry to seek out the God of their conscience. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says that the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When God created man, He did not leave him without a conscience to know right from wrong. He didn't leave him without a conscience to know that there is a God. 
Everybody was born with the law of God written in their hearts. And if they're not willing to seek out that conscience of theirs, they'll never find God himself. In Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. And again, when men do not seek out the God of their conscience, they are doomed to eternal ruin. But if men would seek out the God of their conscience, they would find his plan of salvation. They would find his written word. So besides these Christ rejectors, those who made false professions of faith and the lovers of sin, there'll also be good men and women at the great white throne judgment. There'll be moms and dads and children, and there'll be the religious and even preachers there. And the reason why is because good works do not save a person. Good works do not wash away their sins. Good people aren't necessarily always redeemed. There's only one way to escape the fires of hell, and that's through Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. God didn't save us because we were right with him. Nobody's right with God. He saves us according to his mercy. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation is not of good works. It's not of ourselves. It's through faith. It's through what Jesus has done for us. And by the way, since Jesus purchased our salvation, it is a gift of God, not a reward. But for the saved, they will not stand at the white throne judgment. They won't stand there for their sins, because their sins have already been judged the day they got saved. At that moment, the penalty of their, of their sin was paid for through the shed blood of Christ on the cross, and His blood is a holy blood, sinless, it's pure, and it's powerful enough to wash away all the sins of the world. And if by faith men would come to Christ, they won't have to stand the great white throne judgment. There's no price a man can pay to remove his sin. There's no deed good enough, no work great enough to remove a man's sin. That's why Jesus came to this earth. He came for one reason, that was to go to the cross so he could die for our sins and take our sins upon himself and take our punishment and our hell and our eternal abandonment and pay the complete price so that not one sin was left unpaid for. In John 3.16, the most quoted verse of the Bible, it says that, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God so loved the world, his love is so great, that there aren't enough human words to express God's love. And in this love, God gave himself, he sent his Son on the cross to pay the debt for our sins. And for those who reject Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation, they will stand at the great white throne judgment. And again, that's one place you don't want to be with a guilty verdict. And imagine a moment standing at this great white throne judgment before a holy God and before the angels and the saints and your loved ones. And at that moment, you'll be spiritually naked with nothing to hide. You'll be like fine glass crystal open for all to see. Everything will be exposed. Your thoughts, your motives, your secrets, your hidden sin, all before an all-knowing God. Oh, the shame and the hypocrisy and the pretending. But wouldn't it be something if our sins were written on our foreheads? I guess us men would all be wearing baseball caps trying to hide our foreheads. And women would all have bangs wearing them all the time to cover their foreheads. But one thing you cannot hide your sin from, and that's the Lord. The exposure of sin is inevitable. In Luke chapter 12, verse 2, it says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. And as sure as God's word is true, you can count on this. In Numbers 32, 23, it says, Be sure your sin will find you out. You can be sure, sooner or later, your sin will find you out. Either today, tomorrow, or, or someday at the great white throne judgment, it will find you out. King David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband. And he was a king and he tried to hide it. But you know what? God revealed it for the whole nation to see it. And I think in President Clinton, when he committed that sin with Monica Lewinsky, he tried to hide that, but God exposed it before the nation. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, it says that God shall bring every work to judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And if it isn't now, it'll be later. It'll be at that white throne judgment seat. God's word is true. You can't deny it. 
You can make light of it or rewrite it, but God's word will never change. It talks about in verse 12 of Revelation 20 that the books will be open. And these books are the handwritings and ordinances that are contrary to the sinner. They are accurate records of our sins, not under the blood. They're records of every sin, big sins and small sins. They're records of every idle word that we have spoken. And the Bible will be used at this time too to judge men. In John chapter 12 verse 48 it says, And he that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. God's words is going to judge the unsaved in the last days. And then there's that book of life in verse 15. And it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And on that day, if your name is not in that book of life, God's word makes it clear. You will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What kind of judgment would this be? It'll be a fearful judgment. It'll be a judgment with eternal suffering in the lake of fire, a place where there'll be wailing and gnashing of the teeth, where the flame dieth not. It'll be a place like in Revelation 14, 10, and 11, where it says that the smoke of their torment will ascend up forever. And this smoke of their torment, it comes from burning flesh that's just burning and burning and is never consumed, and it smolders upwards. It'll be a place of eternal damnation. That's a place where you're dying forever and ever. I hate to be dying, that'd be a terrible thing to go through, but to be dying forever and ever, it'll be a place where there's eternal regret and remorse. What could have been if you would have gotten saved? It'll be a fearful judgment, but also be a just judgment, because there'll be no excuses on that day, no exceptions, no blaming. It's too late for forgiveness. Perfect justice, it isn't like our tainted justice here on this side of heaven, but perfect justice demands that the exact due for a penalty is paid, not an ounce more and not an ounce less. And that's what perfect justice is all about. And God is a God of perfect justice. And when a man stands before Christ at that white throne judgment, and he stands there guilty of his sin, there's going to be nothing but perfect justice dealt out towards him. And God is perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, and perfect righteousness is always right. Perfect holiness and righteousness and justice, they know no toleration. They don't make accommodations. There's no compromise under perfect justice. There's no second chances. And God is perfect in all his attributes. And I'm glad that God doesn't favor one person over another and make exceptions like maybe a mother would with her children. No, God is perfectly just, and it's too late at the white throne judgment for any compromise or second chances or for forgiveness or mercy. No, it's final. But thank goodness that God is also perfect in love. And in his so great love, he gave his life to pay the debt for our sins so that we wouldn't have to stand before his judgment seat. For those who have been saved, their sins have been paid. And if you see him into your heart, you can now experience his mercy and forgiveness and grace and his so great love. You know, after living a lifetime here on earth, it's too late when a person stands before Christ and try to give an account of his life. It'll be a final judgment. There'll be no second chances then. No hiding, no purgatory, no escape. And it'll also be a foolish judgment because no one has to end up there. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be a rock star, a movie star, a sports hero. You can be rich. You can be famous. There's no second chances. And it's foolish for a person to let this opportunity go by. I had a man one time that wanted to open up a bakery store. I had a sign shop. And next door was an empty building. And this man wanted to open up a bakery store there. And I did him a sign for his store. I lettered his windows. I did some displays inside his building on the walls. I made him a menu. But I also witnessed to him the whole time. And during this time, he said to me, listen, you're always telling me about this Jesus thing. I'm a busy man right now. Why don't you just wait until I open my bakery up and then I'll let you sit down and tell me about Jesus. And so nine months went by. The night before he opened his store, he died of a heart attack. He died and he went to hell as an unsaved man. It was too late for him. And at that funeral, his family wasn't very friendly to me because they had a guilt feeling towards me. They knew that their dad went to hell. And not only that, they were unsaved themselves because they weren't concerned in learning about salvation's plan. It's so important that we deal with sin today because we don't know when we will die. And not everybody dies as an old person. The time to get saved and settled is now and today. And how do you deal with your sin? You can't deal with it by good works and by your deeds. 
It's only through Jesus Christ that their sins are dealt with. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. There is coming a day soon when everyone on earth and everybody in heaven and those in hell will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They're going to bow their knees and confess it. When that day comes, I know as a Christian, us Christians are going to bow our knees in joy and confess that, yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. But Hitler will also be bowing his knee and Stalin and Saddam Hussein, and they'll be confessing it too. And all those who have not had their name written in the book of life. And let me ask you, is your name in the book of life? Are you saved? Are your sins forgiven? Are you 100% sure that you have eternal life? In Matthew 7:21, it says, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. I pray that you have it settled. If you died today and you stood at the judgment with all your sins piled behind you, and Christ was to ask you, Why should I let you into heaven? What would you say at that moment? What kind of excuses would you give? Whatever you'd come up with, those sins piled up behind you would convince you, wouldn't they? Yes, but you see, we can know that we're going to heaven, for the Bible tells us so. The Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means we're all sinners. And in Romans 6, 23, it says that the wages of sin is death. That means there's a punishment for sin. But praise God for Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. It tells us that the penalty of our sins have been paid for through Jesus Christ. It says that God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And I pray that you get it settled today. And if you're not sure of your salvation, just pray and ask the Lord to save you. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. And I know you died on a cross for me. And I know that my sins are sending me to hell if I don't get it settled. So, Lord, take my sins. Take them upon that cross. And I thank you so much for what you've done for me. And come into my heart and give me this eternal life. It's just a simple prayer to pray. And I pray that this sermon was a blessing to you. Take care and God bless. If you would like more information and other examples of Ray's art in action, check out his website at raydombach.com. Or you can find him on Facebook.